Okay. Oops. How do I make that go away? There. All right. And I don't need Hank on the screen. No, just Hank. Hank. Oh, it's only Hank. Okay. So I don't have a, I don't have a manual slides yet. So are they up on the show now? Yeah. Okay. Then let's make sure I can grab them. Otherwise, uh, when it's time for a manual to come up here, have them on a flash drive just in case I can't get them. I already have Brandon's slides open. Okay. Okay. A manual. I haven't seen this one. Uh, anybody else that has slides besides Brendan, bring them up on a flash drive and plug them to my computer. Yeah, I'll, I'll upload them. If you need a flash drive, we have flash drives. All right. So let's go ahead and get started because we're already recording. All right, welcome. This is now an official IETF meeting, unlike all the rest of the This is an official IETF meeting. Welcome to the suit virtual interim. This is being recorded. Because this is an official IETF meeting, this part is actually covered by the note well. Uh, is everybody familiar with the note well? Are there new people here at the hackathon? Do, right. just, okay. If you haven't been to, through the IETF note well before, it just means that if you're in the conversation and talking about stuff and you know that there's intellectual property associated with, you're obligated to disclose it within a timely fashion during the discussion or shortly afterwards for some definition of short that's basically what this says there's the legalese on there i am not a lawyer but that's roughly what it means is it has to do with intellectual property rights all right uh we need a note taker now of course the slides may have all the notes in it and so the job of a note taker may be really really easy but if there's additional discussion that comes up we need somebody to be able to take notes this goes into the proceedings of the itf is where we pause and we do not go on until we get a volunteer. It should be somebody who's not going to be up here presenting. So it's somebody, Brennan is off the hook. Okay, Russ, okay, great. Uh, we are not using Jabber or anything because WebEx takes care of all that. Okay, this is our published agenda. It was published out ahead of time. Among the hackathon, those of you who were here yesterday, if you're listening to the recording, um, then yesterday we had a report out halfway through the hackathon of what each of the suit and rats and teep groups did. Uh, this part of the meeting, we're gonna have the suit report outs. After the virtual interim meeting is done, then we'll do the teep and rats report outs. Okay? So we won't make the suit report outs happen twice, right? But uh, for the next hour or so, we can dive into any of the discussions around the suit documents and so on. All right, so with that, are there any other agenda things? I know the presenters, uh, Brendan, and uh, you're going to present. Okay. And uh, remind me, what's your first name? Casper. Okay. Okay. Is there any other presenters besides Brennan and Casper? This is the uh, agenda bashing portion. If you have report outs at the end, you can go after the slides. That's fine. It'll just be on audio, and it just means the note taker will have to do a slightly better job at uh, taking your section because you can't just say see slides. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, with that, I think I'm ready to call up Brendan and walk through those slides. Unless there's any other questions. Um, let's see, yours is that one, right? Yeah. Okay, there you go. All right. I'll try um, not to trip on the this is the mic for the recording, so don't stray too far. Okay, stay next to the mic. Right. I, th I think I can not yeah, walk around. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, one of the first items that uh, I've done with uh, help from the TEEP folks here is what's necessary in uh, TEEP in order to, uh, sorry, what's necessary in suit to support TEEP. There was an open question about exactly how security domain construction should work uh, if suit is being used as the transport for TEEP. And uh, the conclusion that we've come to is essentially what I've got here on the slides a specific ordering of fields in the component ID gives a hierarchical view of security domains, the authorities that create them, which TE, TEEs they run on and what the TAs are. So we are hoping that this will be adequately compatible with most uh, TE implementations. If you have any feedback on this, that would be very helpful. Um, the corollary to that is that we're assuming lazy security domain instantiation. 
as in when you access a particular component ID which translates to a particular security domain, if that security domain has not already been created, it will instantiate it when you attempt to write something into it. Mike Line, so if you're in the back, we you know you can't necessarily be heard, so come up here if you want to ask a question. Um, this is for TEs that do not have a concept of an explicit security domain like SGX. Um, we should be clear when putting in the text as to whether the security domain uh, level in the path is actually mandatory, in which case you have to put something in there, or whether you can elide it when there's no such thing. Yep. That is an excellent point. Thank you. Um, Feedback already. All right. Uh, yeah. Can you do a virtual blue sheet, please? Uh, for the people in the room, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Good point. Um, Offhand between those two, I might suggest skipping it in the case that there is no such thing as a security domain, yeah. just because it makes your messages shorter. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I mean, for, from I'm a right. soup perspective, I'm it doesn't care. Uh, the, the soup processor shouldn't actually care too much, so I'm right. not worried about that. Um, so there's still a, a missing slot for TAM URIs in the soup draft. So I think that uh, that's an extension point that needs to be added into the uh, suit draft for uh, publication since I believe that is now the only remaining element that needs to be covered to support TEEP directly in suit. Um, and I think there should be a TA example in the suit draft so that some of this is clearer. Uh, we also did a bit of work on integrating uh, suit and rats and what that's going to look like is effectively defining some E claims for suit specifically. Now, the way that this should work in suit is that the, uh, the manifest should be able to define which elements are going to be added to uh, the attestation report. And so essentially, uh, each claims will be appended to the attestation report on the as the manifest is processed. So there's a few things in there that will need a little uh, modification to the uh, manifest, but uh, that will essentially be replacing some currently nil arguments with a field that says, yes, you should attest this. Um, uh, Brendan, uh, this is Dave Waltermeyer as chair. Um, uh, so did you guys talk about where this work would actually happen? Sorry, say again? Said, where would the work happen? Where, work? Uh, so I'm, up, I'm open to uh, suggestions on that. If, if it's better to be done in suit, that's fine. If it's better to be done in, in uh, rats, that's fine. Uh, I think that it probably should be a separate draft from the suit draft. So I'll put the, the plumbing in for suit to recognize what should be attested, but I'll do it in a generic way so that it's not bound specifically to any other, um, to any other draft. And then that, that information can also be used in rats or possibly in a secondary suit draft to, uh, to yeah. define those eight claims. So this is saying, so, I mean, I, as a participant, I don't have any personal, you know, views on where, where this work should be done. I just wanted to point out that um, we would have to update our charter if we were to take this work on inside suit. On that basis, it sounds more like it should be in rats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should. It should. Oh, this is me. <laughs> Hi Dave, this is Hank. This should be done in, uh, in, in RETS and it should not be done in the EAP document as Lawrence agreed on here. Yeah, okay, because um, we would maybe stopping the progression of the manifest graph due to the dependency to the EAP draft. So we will do it in RETS, but in a separate EAP yeah. claim set graph. Yes. yes. Yeah. Does that okay. make sense? Okay, good. All right, on to the next one. Uh, there is an open question about the encoding of the authentication wrapper. Uh, currently, the authentication wrapper contains cozy objects. The authentication wrapper itself is B string wrapped, but the cozy objects inside the authentication wrapper are not. And there's a question as to whether um, B string wrapping them would make it easier to integrate with existing COSI libraries. So I would appreciate feedback. I've gotten some feedback already that uh, suggests this is a good plan, but I'd appreciate any additional feedback that uh, on um, adding that two-byte pair to. Yeah, you have to hash it, right? 
That's the mic. That's the mic. Okay. That's the mic. Yeah. You have to hash it, right? Hash what? Take your name. Lorenz Stoneblade. You have to hash the objects that you're going to sign there. Oh, so no, this this is wrapping the signing objects themselves okay. in a B string, and the question is whether that would be helpful to existing cozy libraries. No opinion on that. Okay, so I'll leave that as an open question. Uh, <laughs> next. Um, Could you please start a thread on the list? Yes. Okay. Uh, and anything that's in these slides will presumably, I will, if, if there's not a clear resolution, I'll be opening a thread. And uh, you have time between now and IHEF to post a new version of the draft. And so, yeah, planning to. <laughs> yeah. So the point is uh, for any of these things, um, even if there's no discussion on the list after posting the thread, right? Yep. Because maybe nobody really cares either way and either yep. answer is fine. Pick an answer, put it in the draft, yep. and then we can report it out and verify that nobody objects then. Excellent, okay. sounds so good. <laughs> discussion on the list would be great. Uh, so there's a, a question about putting the, or no, there isn't a question. I have made, taken the decision to put a digest of the um, manifest in the cozy payload section. And the reason for this is to enable modular processing of large post-quantum crypto signatures. Uh, if this is a bad assumption, I'd like to hear about it. But for now, this is how it stands. Uh, there's also a question as to whether it matters if you're using EDDSA, uh, which uh, in the COSY draft says for very large payloads, you may want to use a hash and transport it separately which is what I'm doing. So this might be helpful. I'm not sure what extremely large means in this situation. Um, Hank at the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is me, Dave. Um, so I think that this is in general a good idea because we are thinking about uh, having this, uh, the momentarily called the outer wrapper and could maybe the suit envelope and have multiple things in there. And sometimes some of these things should be discarded by the by constraint device. And this is very easy to discard if you just have a digest referencing it from the sign manifest and not the whole thing in the manifest that is very hard to cut out and still, still validate that then. So I think that uh, having this digest to uh, payload feature in the uh, um, envelope in general seems to be a good idea, independent of post quantum and EADSA and COSI and such. Lawrence, uh, the mic. Lawrence, yeah. Isn't there an external data mode for COSI? Yeah. There absolutely is, and that was the original use in suit. Um, it was just a question of whether external data was necessarily compatible with. A, with post quantum signatures. So the issue here, just bear with me. The interest, the the point here is that you would have to first load the um, the manifest portion so that you could digest it, so that you could do, so that you could verify that digest with the signature, which is behind, or which is, which you've now skipped over. So you have to seek backwards, and then you have to do that verification, and you need to use it. So you have to seek forwards again. So this was the, what I was trying to eliminate. That's where I, I come into the modular processing question. Uh, so next, a reference URI, uh, talking about using uh, claims, it makes a certain amount of sense to be able to say, this is where the canonical version of this manifest is stored. If you discover that you don't have the whole copy, that some field has been discarded, this is where you should go to get a copy of it. Uh, maybe a template so that you attach a, um, a the, the hex encoded version of the digest to the end of it or something similar to that to reduce the transmission size. If you're going to test the URI and the digest, it doesn't make sense to do that twice. Um, that's open for discussion, but I think that adding a reference URI in general is probably the right thing to do. As a option. As an option, Not as yeah. Method. No, I, I think there might be some uh, some use cases where it's mandatory, but I think that as an overall concept, it's optional. Um, in the examples, there are some errors. Uh, the vendor ID and class ID 
uh, are parameters in, C in the CDDL that's published in the draft. They are parameters in the description of the draft. However, in the examples, they are not. And uh, th so that, that is an open error, which I'm going to fix. Um, likewise, the try each examples do not have B string wrappers around them. They're supposed to, but they don't. So I need to fix that. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, it looks like minimal loops are going to be uh, a, a benefit, That's something that we need to look into. Uh, specifically, the, a, a loop allowing you to do the same operation for a list of components appears to be a very uh, useful optimization. Uh, now, the, the driving use case for this that made me believe that I actually really need it is that a digest would have to be repeated multiple times if it were copied between components and needed to be verified after each copy. And that seems like a problem. So rather than having it duplicated um, or having some mechanism to assign from one parameter to another, which is currently not an option, uh, this would allow you to do the same operation to a list of components. So assigning the same thing to multiple places works in a fairly straightforward way. Um, so far, I haven't found a compelling use case for map test execute, which is something we've discussed in the past, except for the prioritized parameter lists that I have been asked for. But that seems like a pretty niche use case so far. So I'm not exploring it at the moment. It's another minimal loop, which is why I brought it up. That was my last yeah. slide, but I have one more thing to add. It appears that um, the seaboard encode or seaboard decoding that I've been doing is going to be uh, pulled out of my library, maybe and available more widely. So, uh, I just don't know if that's useful to anyone, so just thought I'd mention it. Don't go away, uh, okay. Dave Failer of the participant mic. Um, I wanted to record in here the discussion we had at the end of the day yesterday, which stemmed from, can you go back to your slide about the, uh, the, the minimal lists, yes. minimal loops, yeah. Yes. So the question had to do with, uh, you didn't have a slide about the suit error being uh, recorded in a present oh, yes. And so if you can talk about that a bit, and there was the question about right. whether you would go past the first error in the loop case. Okay, okay. So, so the idea um, that was discussed was that Enter into the manifest is almost or is necessary and almost sufficient to indicate where a, a uh, an update has failed. And so adding that as an additional attestation claim uh, might be interesting. It's not necessarily uh, a measurement. I'm not effectively. Yeah, but it is effectively yeah. a measurement. Uh, so the idea here is that um, a device would report probably two pointers because of this structure. So one pointer would be which component ID it was on, and the other pointer would be where it was in the sequence. In the loop, yeah. And that would be sufficient as long as you bail out of the loop as soon as you hit the first error. That so is correct. So there's only one error possible at a time. That is correct. And that is sufficient information. There was another question as to whether um, conditions that have failed should also be included in uh, the attestation list. Uh, now, my concern with that approach is that it could get quite large in some cases. Um, I'm not sure how to handle that one yet. I haven't thought about it enough. <laughs> Input welcome. And that is it for me. Flash drive. So, uh, are these slides been uploaded yet by somebody else? Okay, great. So, uh, Dave or anybody remotely, they should be up shortly. Oh, interesting. I have to unplug this so that I have space to uh, fit in the USB drive. Because the other ones are too close together. Okay, great. Can you just use that slide? There's, I don't know how to get to full screen in this. Is that sufficient for you? <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if this will go up and down. No, you'll have to you have to use page up, page down on the keys here. Where's page up, page down? Oh, I know. I could say. That's fine. This, this isn't doing because I unplugged it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. Slide, so it's been... Okay, great. Go.
All right, um, so I'm Kasper, short report on what we did uh, with the implementation, suit implementation in Riot. Um, where did we start? Uh, there was already implementation that, used, that was usable um, based on based on the last year's first uh, version of the draft, and uh, well, it works. Uh, there's a full workflow for people who want to replicate what you what what, uh, what it does. There's uh, even the VM and extensive documentation, so uh, you can use it. But it's the old version of the draft. So we tried obviously to update it to the new draft. Um, we did not succeed. So we, uh, we integrated Brandon's uh, nice new suit to it into our build system and everything. Uh, we refactored our code a lot, added unit tests, so we have like, to make it easier. Uh, and then we made like a, our parsing code fail on the new draft uh, structure. Um, we were told like there were not so many changes. <laughs> <laughs> we got to know that, well, there were not so many changes recently. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that is uh, still ongoing work. <laughs> but going strong. So what did we learn? We found, as Brent said, um, some, some glitches uh, in the manifest generating tool. Brent was very fast to uh, fix most of them already. Uh, I think all the other fixes are in the, in the queue. Um, yeah, and we realized that the structure of the manifest is quite difficult. We asked for some, some graphical representation. Brendan, we, we discussed tools. <laughs> so yeah, we're looking forward to that. Let's finish this. Questions? Questions? The next presentation doesn't have any slides, so uh, we're just going to talk. I do have a, a blinding. <laughs> I did write this up on a, a wiki page for the hackathon. If you want to link to that. Uh, um, I don't remember what the wiki page is. Is it linked from the? It's linked from the, the Kubernetes main workshop page. Okay. Yeah. Well, that takes you one down, but on the right should be a link. The where pages it's covered by the by the attendee list. Oh, the, which one do you want? The on? third one down. Okay. MC, the gotcha. One up. Oh, yeah. It overrides. Let's do that. Huh? One did link, but it wasn't yours. MC boot, yeah. All right. So I'm David Brown. Um, I think everybody here knows that. Um, so our goal for the, the suit hackathon started out as incorporate Brendan's suit parser into MCU boot. Um, turns out that was a bit lofty of a goal for the hackathon. <laughs> we reduced the scope a bit and were somewhat successful with that. So what we basically ended up doing is we modified the tool in MCU boot called an image tool to accept a suit argument on its sign command. And this invokes the Python manifest generator, currently with a hard-coded manifest that has nothing to do with the image you're signing. <laughs> um, generates this hard-coded manifest, it then signs it with the key that's in the MCU boot and it embeds that in the image in place of the manifest in MCU Boot's bespoke format. This um, then within MCU Boot itself, I basically stubbed out the code that does all of the existing verification. I find this manifest, copy it to RAM, and then I jump into the suit parser, the initial function in the suit parser, which basically just walks through it and pulls a sequence number out of it. And when we were wrapping up, we just got to the point where that worked. So wow. that, that's our status. We can we can print them um, <laughs> in a very complicated manner. It's ahead of work in <laughs> Yeah. So the, I mean, the complexity here, as far as what comes next, the MCU boot logic is a bunch of C code that does a bunch of steps to find the images and then decide what to do. It then may do a swap, it may do a run. With the suit manifest, some of those things are instructions in the manifest itself. So there's a bit of unweaving of the MC boot code so that these things are more functions that would get called, some code that would call those based on what the manifest says. But 
I think this is, um, I sent a little status update to the other maintainer of MCU boot. And he's like, are there pull requests ready? <laughs> so there is definitely some interest in this. So we'll uh, move forward with this step. Any questions? Brendan at the mic. Uh, is there anything I can do to uh, make sure that updates that are done to the suit loader code, especially in regards to the examples that don't match the CDDL, um, makes it into the work you're doing? Um, yes, as long as I know that they happen, we are a, a, a sub-module, okay. a Git sub-module. The code is being, it's probably gonna end up having to be a fork if I have to modify it first to make it work. But currently, the at least the parser just compiled without changes, so. Excellent. But I will be in communication with you. All right, thanks. Anybody else from the suit group that wants to report out on what they accomplished? Besides the three that were already in there, or is everything kind of summarized in those three? Uh, and I know, uh, Brendan, you'd said uh, the CBOR part was going to be separated from your uh, implementation into a separate piece so that people could decide whether they're like, if the discussion was, if your only use of CBOR is for the suit parser, then the 250 byte version might be sufficient. If you also are doing other things with CBOR, you probably have a full CBOR parser for your other purpose and you can use that with a suit address. So that was the discussion we had. Um, all right, is there any? 278. 278 million, okay, well, <laughs> extra 28 bytes. Sorry, Brendan, you're out. <laughs> yeah. After a place All right, uh, are there other things that people wanted to bring up? Discuss. The, the, this one? Oh, yes. Is the suit parser running out? Yeah, yes. if you want to come up and talk about this one, yeah. okay. State your name? Yes, uh, I'm Yuichi Takita. Uh, in this hackathon, I tried to implement uh, my suit uh, implementation, uh, current uh, private uh, implementation, uh, pass uh, running on Opti environment. Uh, first, I checked uh, interoperability that my suit pass, uh, pass uh, latest manifest gen plus uh, five, manifest five. Uh, that's all. Oh, okay. That is okay. Uh, second, I built a uh, parser on Opti environment uh, and confirm uh, that it works uh, without problem. Uh, this is a diagram. Uh, first, a normal app, a normal world, on normal world, normal app uh, load manifest. Next, uh, four class app and uh, manifest files. Uh, that uh, normal apps uh, copy uh, the manifest file on uh, shared level. Next, uh, call uh, process app uh, pass uh, that uh, manifest uh, file uh, on shared memory. But uh, not yet to uh, verify uh, manifest uh, in this hackathon. Yes. Uh, that is work. Uh, what we learned uh, in this hackathon? Mm. For my uh, first time, uh, I touched Opti and development. So uh, <laughs> and that is a um, little hard, uh, especially <laughs> um, complex make files. So um, current, currently, uh, my uh, private uh, pass implementation needs a few external library. So um, that is okay. But uh, very much so. Um, from now on, uh, maybe uh, if the number of external library increases, uh, I think uh, TA build uh, work uh, a bit hard. I think so. Yes, that's all. Is, and is your implementation available on GitHub or is it just your? <laughs> I can't, uh, no plan, yeah. Questions? 
on the DE side, did in Opti, did you uh, does that you know, run as a trusted application or inside Opti? Yes, trusted uh, application inside Opti. Is it a pseudo TA? Yeah, is it a, uh, a regular TA or a uh, pseudo TA? Uh, uh, so TA. Okay, yes. And for people who don't know, Opti pseudo TA means the TA bundled inside the Opti binary itself. That where normal TAs are separate binaries, if you compile it into the same binary as a TA, it looks like a TA, but it's not separable from Opti. Yes. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so I can go back to the wiki here. We cover it. Oh, question? Uh, no, just wanted to mention uh, okay. it. Um, I know that uh, Eidogan worked on integrating T posi to writeness. I was going to say, who is ever is this one? Please come up and say something. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he left already, but. Um, no, oh, that's the one that. Okay, gotcha. You can talk about it. I'll, I'll go back. Yeah, there you are. Is there actually a page? Is there actually a page? Right now. I wonder if the link changed. Let's go back and just no, ref like we probably just refresh. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you left us a nice message. Um, basically, he managed to um, create a package for Riot for both Ecosy and uh, QCBO, QCBO is a dependency. And um, he's open a, well, open a pull request soon. I watched it uh, from Pytes and Links, fine. And, uh, yeah. uh, is that code open or is that code private? That code is, uh, I think, open, but it's not fully specific. Yes, it's the branch. It's not a good question. Yeah. Yeah, and this was from, uh, I don't know how to say his name, but he already left, right? So thanks for reporting out for him. All right. Are there any other report outs from the hackathon learnings? From the suit. From, that's what I mean, from the suit hackathon learnings. So this is a question to suit. Right. Everything covered? Great. Seems like we've made a bunch of good progress. Um, so I guess next uh, steps in the action items, um, <laughs> yeah, there's two things. There's what's on the drafts, I think, within the suit working group. Um, the only thing that I've heard that needs a draft update is the suit manifest document. And that's what Brendan was talking about is uh, that should be done uh, before the internet draft deadline, which is like second nice. week of March, <laughs> second week of March. Yeah, so a couple weeks, uh, but not that long. Um, and I didn't hear anything that would have necessitated any changes to architecture or information model. Uh, separately, there would be a suit related document in the RATS working group that might be a new, a new document, is what I heard. Uh, and we should verify with uh, the chairs and stuff that we can add a new document to there, um, as opposed to adding it to the say that the suit working group charter. Um, and so here at the inclination of the people in the room here, what I've heard is that it's better to do that in RATS, right? But we need to run that by our ADs, I expect that would be fine. Um, so then separately, we have a hackathon coming up at IETF 107, and I hope that a bunch of this work can resume there at a suit table at IETF 107. Ask how many people here are gonna be at the IETF 107 hackathon? Raise your hand. In Vancouver. Vancouver. Vancouver, and it's the, what's the, March 21st through 26th, somewhere in that, somewhere in that neighborhood, okay? So I see, well, I just want an account. One, two, three, four, five. Actually, I'm going to count twice. Raise your hand if you're going to be at the hackathon, and then I'm going to have you put down, then I'm going to say who's going to be at the suit table, right? Okay. So right now, if you're just going to be at the hackathon, raise your hand for ITF 107. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people in the room. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody remote uh, that wants to raise their hand, but I counted eleven in the room. Dave, you still there? Welcome, Eric. I am. Okay. Are you going to be at the hackathon? Yes. Okay, 12. Great. And let me know if there's anybody else. I didn't see anybody else on WebEx yet. So, all right. How many people would be sitting at the suit table at Hackathon as opposed to just present in the room? Yeah, okay. Because yeah. <laughs> some people move back and forth between tables. Yeah, okay. I see at least three people in the room that would be at the suit table. 
Uh, some of us would be in an adjacent team and went on call back and forth. Yeah, I see several people in that neighborhood. All right, thank you. All right. I'll be at the okay. same table. Yeah, David Waltermeyer says he'll be at the same table. Thanks. Okay, is there anything else that we have before we close the uh, intro meeting? Well, we're recording it as part of the proceedings of the it's covered by note well, right? And so, so we don't have to be. We, we will start. We will stop recording. Okay? Whether the WebEx stays open after that, I don't know. But, uh, yes, they are publicly accessible. So uh, if you go to the IETF site, you go under meetings, you look at uh, proceedings, and then all the proceedings that pass virtual meetings are there, and they're all linked to the actual recordings. There, there is like a month. They won't be there next week, but yeah, they'll be there by the time we get to ITF 107. Okay, then if there's nothing else, the rest of you have anything else then? Okay, then let's go ahead and uh, close the meeting. Uh, all right. Dave Waltermeyer, any last words before we close? Uh, thank you, everyone. And Dave, I'm going to send you some notes. Could you turn them into minutes while we're on airplane? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to. And I'm just curious, how was the audio for your remote league? Were you able to hear what was going on just fine? It wasn't bad. I mean, there were a few like muted conversations in the background, but it was mostly good. Okay, great. We've been having uh, internet connectivity issues all day, so we're happy to hear that the audio was reliable. We were scared that it was going to be flaky, so pleasantly surprised. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, we will go ahead. Thank you. Bye-bye. And... Uh, uh, recorder, save recorded meeting. Do I have to save the recorded meeting? I'm going to save it anyway. Okay. Uh, suit intro at. That's what I think it's doing. I've never done that before. Uh, but apparently, I can't stop the recording. I can only save it. Recorder panel. There we go. Stop. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, I think I've stopped sharing or stopped recording. No, it's stop. It, it, okay. And oh, recording is in Carl progress. Showed up just now. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and there was somebody else I think said bye. But okay. Welcome, Juan Carlos. Uh, let's. We need to add Juan That's Carlos to the blue sheet. Yes, please. Thank you. We, we had a physical blue sheet that went around the room, and then we added the remote people's names to us. So we're just going to add you into the uh, blue sheet that happens to be white. Thanks for that. All right, great. We're going to sign off now. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.